politics here on Earth, the exopolitics of our galaxy, and how these intersect with spiritual transformation through my unique perspective. If this is your first time joining us, I encourage you to check out the archives here on People for People Radio or my YouTube channel to find all of the episodes of Convergence. And I'm pretty sure you're going to be glad that you did. Today in episode 19, part 2, I'm very pleased to bring back my friend Preston Dennett. And today we're going to hear more about his latest book called Wondrous. The extraterrestrials have arrived. Wondrous contains 25 all-new original cases of people who have had extensive UFO encounters. Published for the first time, these true, first-hand accounts cover the gamut of the UFO phenomenon. Sightings, USOs, landings, face-to-face -face meetings with ETs, onboard UFO encounters, and whistleblower stories revealing shocking secrets the government doesn't want you to know. Preston Dennett takes you on a fascinating journey deep into the heart of the unknown. These 25 startling and wondrous UFO encounters will change the way you view at UFOs and these strange visitors to our planet. These 25 incredible accounts represent the cutting edge of UFO research and answer many of the mysteries surrounding the UFO phenomenon. Greys, praying mantis ETs, human-looking ETs, strange humanoids, they're all here. High strangeness is a regular feature of UFO encounters and these cases do not disappoint. Before we continue with this fascinating subject, here's a little background information about Preston Dennett. Preston began investigating UFOs and the paranormal in 1986 when he discovered that his family, friends, and co-workers were having dramatic, unexplained encounters. Since then, he has interviewed hundreds of witnesses and investigated a wide variety of paranormal phenomena. Preston is a field investigator for the Mutual UFO Network, also known as MUFON. He's a ghost hunter, a paranormal researcher, and the author of 28 books and more than 100 articles on UFOs and the paranormal. Several of his books have been Amazon UFO bestsellers. His articles have appeared in numerous magazines, including Fate, Atlantis Rising, MUFON UFO Journal, Nexus, Paranormal Magazine, UFO Magazine, Phenomena Magazine, Mysteries Magazine, Ufologist, and others. His writing has been translated into several different languages, including German, French, Portuguese, Russian, and Icelandic. He has appeared on numerous radio and television programs, including Midnight in the Desert with Art Bell, Coast to Coast, and also the History Channel's Deep Sea UFOs and UFO Hunters. His research has been presented in the LA Times, the LA Daily News, the Dallas Morning News, and other newspapers. He has taught classes on various paranormal subjects and lectures across the United States. He currently resides in Southern California and you can check out his website at www.prestondennett.weebly.com. Hi Preston, welcome back to the show. Hi, Karen. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, sorry we got cut off last time. No, that's okay. It gives us more chance to talk about your wonderful new book. Um, how are things generally going for you? Going really well. Yeah, just recently went to UFO MegaCon. Did a presentation there. It was awesome. And uh, yeah, things are going great. I'm super busy. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I'm so glad. 
Now, last time we um, started episode 19, we talked a little bit about why are ETs here and whether they were hostile or benevolent and what their agenda was for this planet. So I encourage everybody to check out the archives and find um, part one of episode 19 to get a lot of really good information about these questions. And then um, Preston, I think we covered a school teacher who encountered a 15 foot tall mantis alien during her morning jog outside her home. And we talked about when um, another woman, she had these weird alien symbols that just appeared on her body. And um, it began her journey that led her to a rather shocking discovery. And I'm not sure where we left off after that, but um, is there any, anything you'd like to just say to introduce your book called Wondrous to our audience? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Karen. I'm super excited about this one. This contains all new cases that have never been published before. And I wanted to include cases that I think have something to contribute to our understanding of this phenomenon. So there's a wide variety of cases. Uh, like you mentioned, I've got some really interesting whistleblower accounts that I've been trying to include for a while, but just, mm -hmm. nev just never had room for them. Uh, but yeah, some really couple of landing cases, some interesting sighting cases with telepathic contact, uh, some, of course, onboard UFO encounters. Those are my favorite. Lots of info there. Mm -hmm. uh, a really interesting USO account. Oh, I'd love to talk about that one. Sure. Why don't we so, Why don't we start off with that one? Oh, okay. Yeah, I love. You know, I've done a lot of research into USOs, unidentified mm -hmm. submersible objects. Mm -hmm. uh, because I started. I mean, I got cases from the very beginning, back way back in nineteen. 86. Well, 88 is when I really started digging in. Mm -hmm. uh, but immediately started getting accounts of USOs off the Southern California coast here. Mm -hmm. And uh, just kept getting them. At one point, I went on a television. I got a wonderful opportun opportunity to go on the History Channel and do a show called Deep Sea UFOs. Mm -hmm. uh, I got great ratings. They called me back. They actually had record ratings for that show, so they called me back for episode another episode. Wonderful. Yeah, it was really cool, and uh, just got a flood of reports from after that. Ended up writing a book on it. Still more reports, and mm -hmm. this next this next one is, I have to tell you, one of the most interesting and unique USO reports I have ever received. Oh, I can't wait to hear about <laughs> it. So yeah, this occurred one evening in August of 1997. I talked to two of the witnesses, there were three, um, Joy Williams, her husband, Tom, and another lady. Mm -hmm. they, li they live in the Monterey Bay area, sort of central California, northern California, along the coast. Mm -hmm. And this is a very deep water area, I mean, the Monterey Trench, right off the coast there is very, very deep. Mm -hmm. uh, so that might be significant here. At any rate, Joy and her husband Tom had gone to visit a friend and were having dinner. The, their friend's house overlooks the Monterey Bay. It's about a quarter mile away. Mm -hmm. So after dinner, <laughs> Joy decides she's going to step out on the balcony, the little kind of deck they have there, and just look out over the bay. It's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And she's watching the water um, when she sees this weird kind of bright yellow glow in the water. And she's watching it, trying to figure out what the heck it, it could be when it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And suddenly this thing comes up out of the water. And uh, she says, whatever this thing was, it was quite large. Uh, she's estimating maybe 50 feet across, sort of this large oval shape, uh, bright yellow, green, glowing, and she could clearly see kelp or, you know, seaweed covering this thing as it comes out of the water. It just starts sliding off as this thing rises up out of the water. The water, you know, slides off of it, 
the seaweed slides off and this thing raises up a couple of hundred feet over the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's a military brat, you know, ra raised on military bases. Mm -hmm. she, she knows her aircraft, has never seen anything like this, and immediately calls out her husband and friend. And so they come running out and see, watch this thing. And this thing has portholes or what could be lights uh, around their circumference. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, their friend says, you know, there's a telescope right here, <laughs> which is already set up on her uh, deck. Mm -hmm. So they so they go over to the telescope and they look at this thing through the telescope. And they can clearly see now that this is a large, solid object. And it does have portholes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they are different colors, like red, uh, yellow and green, kind of. Mm -hmm. And uh, this object starts to travel along the coastline, just kind of meandering slowly along. Mm -hmm. and, and it is, this is where it gets really interesting. <laughs> it, is, it is heading straight for the coal power plant, the Moss Landing coal power plant. Oh. Yeah, this is located right nearby, uh, right along the coast, and it heads, makes a beeline for it. You know, it takes a good 15, 20 minutes to get there, uh, but it eventually does arrive, and it hovers right at the top of these, I think they're about 200 feet high, these smokestacks. Mm -hmm. There are these two smokestacks at the Moss Landing power plant, and this object hovers right smack next to the top of them, right at the openings, mm -hmm. and sort of parks there. And now here's where it gets even more bizarre, and I've never heard of anything like this. Mm -hmm. uh, this object emits, sort of extrudes, this metallic-looking arm, which comes out the far side of the craft, mm -hmm. um, reaches up over the object, and extends down into the opening of the top of the smokestacks. And the, wow. <laughs> right? I've and never heard of anything like that before. Neither have I. I mean, I've heard of UFOs hovering over power plants of all kinds. Mm -hmm. Copper smelting plants, nuclear power stations, dams, electrical power stations, you name it. Mm -hmm. They are very interested in, I think, sort of tracking our technology. Uh, so perhaps that's what was going on here, but they, on the end of this arm was this gigantic pair of pincers, sort of like a, a claw. <laughs> and uh, she's just estimating from the size of these smokestacks, she says this craft had to be mm, easily 50 feet across, maybe 100, but the pincers, this claw itself, had to be at least 20 feet in size. So big. <laughs> and it starts digging around inside the top of this smokestack. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it was putting something there, some sort of device. It was mm -hmm. scratching the insides to measure. I'm speculating here, but I'm thinking that it was measuring the pollution that's coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, because this is sort of a big thing for UFOs. Mm -hmm. Contactee contactees are taken on board. They are often, um, quite often, given warnings about pollution, mm -hmm. about, about how we're destroying our planet, <laughs> uh, this sort of thing. So I am guessing that that's what was going on here, that this UFO was there to sort of monitor what's coming out of these smokestacks. Mm -hmm. uh, but such a strange case. And, <laughs> but all three witnesses, here's another interesting thing, all three witnesses felt very much like this object knew that they were observing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it made them a little nervous, especially their host. She was not <laughs> very happy. They were all a little bit nervous about it mm -hmm. uh, because this was not something they had ever seen before. None of them have any history of UFO contact. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? They call the police. And... <laughs> Oh, I'm, this is a little disappointing to me. They, mm -hmm. they, they call the police and the police 
uh, stuck the officers listening patiently as they describe what's happening. And he was very polite, very kind at first until they used the word UFO or it became clear that that's what they were describing. Mm -hmm. And this police officer's attitude, which was very friendly at first, mm -hmm. turned, turned 180 degrees and became somewhat hostile. <laughs> and uh, he says, oh, you're just seeing a boat. That's what you're saying. It's just a boat. And they both said, what? <laughs> what? No, it's in the air. It's floating in the air next to the smokestacks. It's got an arm. It's digging inside of it. It's not a UF. I mean, it's not a boat. This is something we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And the officer was not receptive. He basically felt awkwardly ended the call. Oh, uh, that's too bad. Yeah, they were not getting anywhere with him, so... It was a mutual decision to end the call. Mm -hmm. uh, they did later call up a radio station to see if they got any reports, but the radio station denied it. Mm -hmm. and th this is weird because this is a fairly well populated area. Mm -hmm. And what they were seeing was not, you know, subtle. <laughs> this was not inconspicuous. This was something ev a lot of people should have been seeing. Mm -hmm. but then again, I've heard this a million, well, you know, a lot. Uh, sometimes it, it appears that only a few people are seeing something that everybody should be seeing. Mm -hmm. And I know for, I mean, a pretty well-established fact that uh, UFOs do have this ability to show themselves to whoever they want and block their view from who, whoever, whoever they want. Mm -hmm. And this can be in a, you know, at a party crowd of people all together in the same place. Some will see it and some won't. Mm -hmm. Very strange. So I'm thinking that it was showing itself off to them intentionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and probably to other people too, because most people don't report it. Um, they, they were certainly unusual in that regard to call the police. Mm -hmm. uh, but she did end up calling MUFON. She you know, called other researchers like Linda Moulton Howe. Mm -hmm. uh, she really wanted to get the word out about this case because it was so unusual. Mm -hmm. And here's another interesting little end note. I did some digging and got found some kind of interesting information. Uh, mm -hmm. This sighting over Moss Landing, uh, while unique, is not alone. I found three other cases, both before and afterwards, of UFOs hovering directly over the Moss Landing coal power plant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it looks like they're trying to tell us something. I would base that on the fact that um, some people are able to see what's going on. Obviously, the ETs are drawing attention to themselves, or well, I guess, if the, yeah, e um, just the fact that it came out of the water and 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 really got their attention and all of that speaks to that they want they're trying to tell us something and if you've had three sightings with it going to the same place you know which is possibly probably um, a, a major polluting element in our environment and understanding too the way that um, our physical health affects our ability to develop spiritually as well as physically, I would agree with you that they, they want to be seen. And there's a message here. And this topic has been so shut down for so long. Uh, and, and I don't know of any topic that won't that will get you stigmatized faster than talking about, you know, our experiences with ETs. Uh, how do you feel about that, Preston? Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, I got involved in this field kicking and screaming. <laughs> I was one of those who was really skeptical, uh, just didn't want to talk about it. Uh -huh. I, I was repulsed by the subject. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, of course, I've come, come around. <laughs> and um, yeah, back when I got involved, uh, people were really hostile towards this subject ridiculed it mercilessly. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been ridiculed uh, by people, you know, who sh co-workers. Well, not actually not too badly overall. I have to say the people 
within my circle of family, friends, and coworkers have been largely receptive to it. Not everyone, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of them have had their own encounters. And I'm very encouraged now to see things really turning around. The yes. Yeah, the stigma is not quite gone, but it is darn close. I mean, seriously, this is a subject I think that we're on the verge of disclosure, we're on the verge of open official contact, mm -hmm. we're, we're on the verge of living in a very different world and accepting the fact that, you know, we're not alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, you only have to go outside at night and look at the stars for a few minutes to come to that conclusion. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are so, so many stars uh, I, that it's pretty obvious we're not alone in the universe. Uh, I'm not sure why there's so much strong resistance to accepting the extraterrestrial presence on Earth as a current, ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is changing, and now I don't get dirty looks, or I don't get, you know, eye rolling and head shaking what I get is people coming up to me sharing their accounts or asking for information mm -hmm. so yeah I am very encouraged I think it's time people accept what's going on mm -hmm. I, I still have a lot of sympathy for people who are being taken on board and having a hard time with it or keeping it hidden from family members because mm -hmm. uh, uh, a lot a lot of people are having contact and not just sightings but full-on contact mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it seems like there's kind of two disclosures going on at the same time there's the official waiting for the government to tell us which i have mixed feelings about um, um, because they have been part of this huge cover-up which has discredited so many people and caused so much harm, uh, a hardship, fear. I mean, my initial reaction was terror to all of this. It took me years and years to get used to, um, you know, what it means, what it is, and um, my own personal safety. That I guess that was what freaked me out most of all, is realizing how far advanced these beings are and, and, and what, what good purpose would I have. It, you know, that kind of worried me. But um, we're having the other kind of disclosure, which is just a myriad of experiences. Probably it's getting to the point where if we had full uh, cultural contact with the whole globe, we would see possibly even millions of encounters. And so this is also something that's bubbling up with or without official uh, disclosure, which is to me the most obvious kind of disclosure and, and what's so amazing about your book, Wondrous, is that you're helping to demystify this whole process. You're helping to remove some of that stigma. You're helping uh, us to see how many different kinds of experiences there are. And they're all legitimate. And there seems to be an underlying current or message to all of this where... Um, Although, uh, as we discussed in the last episode, there are people who have some frightening experiences. Mostly what's happening is an enlightenment to humankind and a positive um, influence on our culture. And um, so that's why I think it's so important to get information like this out to people. Because the more we're exposed to it, then the less weird it all seems and the more it all starts starts to make sense so with that um i just want to turn it back over to you sorry i didn't mean to go down a rabbit hole but um <laughs> no no i, I it's totally such a big thing preston I, I totally agree with what you're saying we don't need the government to disclose you know they have shown that their untr untrustworthiness their mm -hmm. unwillingness their lack of transparency uh cover-up is not speculation we know it is fact it's mm -hmm. been proven it's easily demonstrable mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be a mistake to look to them for guidance that they've made it pretty clear they don't have our own best interests in mind mm -hmm. Disclo disclosure will come from the most powerful force on this planet which is us the people mm -hmm. and uh, so I am very 
I think most people on this planet are good people. Mm -hmm. uh, and while the media is very fear-based, and I think there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation being put forth to uh, mm -hmm. cloud the truth about this, uh, the truth can take care of itself. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty clear uh, that UFOs are real and they're here. They're not here to hurt us. If they were truly here to hurt us, uh, they would have taken over long ago. And, mm -hmm. I, and uh, I totally agree with you. There is a message to a lot of these encounters. And what I'd like to do is just tell you about another case that I think oh, that please do. Yeah, speaks to that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually a really well known case, uh, but I have a new witness. And oh my God, it's so amazing. Wonderful. Uh, you, you may have heard of the Malmstrom Air Force Base encounter. This occurred on March 16, 1967, when multiple UFOs hovered very low over Malmstrom Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. This is in Montana. They were These objects were viewed by multiple military officers on the base at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and one by one, they shut down the nuclear ICBM missiles at the base. Mm -hmm. Boom, 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 shut them down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this caused, of course, near panic at the high levels of the base. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was an immediate investigation. A vicious cover-up was clamped down. All the witnesses who saw anything were instructed very clearly not to talk about it. Mm -hmm. However, thanks, thanks to Captain Robert Salas, who was there, mm -hmm. uh, he started talking to other witnesses, started investigating. In 1994, he went public. Uh, 11 years later, in 2005, he wrote a book about his own experiences and some of the other witnesses. And it was in 2015 that uh, another witness who was there, a guy by the name of Mel Hansen, mm -hmm. he was, he's then 77 years old, uh, heard that this incident was being discussed on television. His daughter told him, and says, Dad, this is what you told me about. Mm -hmm. uh, those UFOs you saw when you were at Malmstrom, it's on TV. And so he said it felt like it was time to tell a story. He contacted a number of radio stations and UFO researchers. Couldn't mm -hmm. get a hold of anybody, but finally got a hold of me. Um, I could not be, have been more delighted. Really mm -hmm. neat, really neat guy. And uh, he t told me this incredible story of his participation in this incident. He was actually um, at one of the missile sites uh, performing routine maintenance on one of the missiles there. Mm -hmm. so this was at night late at night, not quite midnight, but almost. And he's outside, some of the other people are underground. And he says, it was a really eerie night, very quiet. And suddenly this UFO just comes sliding over head, totally quiet and parks itself right above the missile site. It's huge. It's blocking off the stars. Mm -hmm. uh, can't tell how big or quite how low, but it's clearly pretty low uh, yeah. and just hovers there and uh, every, the security personnel are going a little bit crazy. They're radioing in uh, saying there's something over the missile and uh, this is in a pretty remote location. It takes an hour to drive there from you know Malmstrom base proper. Uh, so they, this Malmstrom security team is sending out a Jeep with other guards to this site mm -hmm. and meanwhile they're watching this ufo and boom it shuts down the missile site it cuts off the electric power mm -hmm. and what happens according to mel is that this missile immediately goes back online with the diesel power generator mm -hmm. and uh they're still watching it Mel was instructed to stay inside the Jeep, don't get out, <laughs> but he couldn't resist. He finally at some point just had to get a closer look. He steps out of the Jeep and looks up. And at this point, the diesel power generator stops working and the missile goes offline again and immediately goes back on with a third fail safe. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it has battery power. And shortly later, the battery power goes out. <laughs> so I, I just find this fascinating because these UFOs cut down, I mean, went through all the fail safes to keep these missiles operating. Mm -hmm. And finally, the, uh, you know, about an hour into this, the security team arrives and instructs Mel and his team to vacate, to go back to the base, which they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mel is the, the next morning given a security debriefing and told in no uncertain terms not to talk about this or he would lose his job. Wow. And he was, in fact, you know, shipped away from Malmstrom back to uh, Hill Air Force Base in Utah, where he, you know, originally had, you know, been working. Mm -hmm. uh, so they removed a lot of people who had actually seen what was going on here. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, covered up the event. Uh, did their best to cover it up. Researchers have since located documents about this event that have been declassified, uh, but any mention of UFOs has been completely scrubbed from the reports. All it says is that the missiles went offline mm -hmm. uh, due to a malfunction, quote, malfunction. Uh, yeah, some, some, a malfunction with the big message. So really what they were kind of saying uh, what, or the message, what I get is, doesn't matter what power source you use to try to launch these, we can stop you and we will. And um, of course the systems of power really don't want to hear that, don't want to face that. And so they just keep burying everything and, and, and um, making people be quiet in, in their various ways that they've been using for what? What is it? Seventy years, um, Preston? That we that we've been having experiences. Yeah, yeah, at least. Well, I know that there's a constant stretching back to the early 1940s. Really, mm -hmm. is when our government knows for sure that mm -hmm. UFOs are real. So that's 60, 70, 80 years, really. It's uh, it's been a, it's been a, a lot longer. I mean, we even see um, images in in medieval artwork. So we, we know this has been happening, but I'm talking about, yeah, in our lifetimes or, or um, maybe more than our lifetime, obviously, we're not 70. But you know what I mean, in a contemporary time frame, this has been going on for a long time. Yeah, and, and our government's refusal to admit the truth about UFOs is completely disingenuous. They know. Yeah. They know not only that UFOs are real, but what they are. And mm -hmm. for them, you know, this recent disclosure, which is supposed to happen in, what, three days, mm -hmm. um, and they're bouncing around these ideas, well, you know, artifacts on radar, on film, uh, mm -hmm. or uh, Russian, Chinese, uh, mm -hmm. un unexplained, we're not sure, we're not sure. They mm -hmm. are 100% sure what this is. Mm -hmm. they, they know that this is extraterrestrials. This is mm -hmm. not, not like some weird interdimensional mystery. No, they know, they know, they know, they know. They've mm -hmm. got not only really good footage, uh, we have the Roswell craft. We mm -hmm. have multiple craft that have been recovered. Alien bodies. There have been face-to-face -face diplomatic meetings with extraterrestrials over and over again. The Malmstrom incident is not unique. It happened in South Dakota, it happened in mm -hmm. Russia, it happened in England, you know, Rendlesham Forest. Anything nuclear, the ETs have come down and said, what are you doing? I agree yeah. with you, this is a message. Yeah, this this ties into another, um, another I'm um, not sure if it's a chapter, or part of, of your book, Wondrous. And that was the um, account of the, mili of the uh, military officer who was invited into the inner sanctum of the government, UFO cover-up. And what, yes. did he, what did he learn? Because obviously it really shook him up, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is a very interesting gentleman who I've been in contact with for quite some time. Uh, I know he's legit. I verified his employment. Uh, he is a retired military officer and he was on uh, 
one of the uh, the USS Kit, a, a Navy ship, mm -hmm. and has a long military background, and uh, was always interested in UFOs, anything paranormal really. And when the internet came along, he started joining chat groups and talking with people, mm -hmm. and uh, started connecting with people within government, high levels of government, because uh, he himself had you know secret clearance. And uh, he started talking to some people who were very high level in government. And uh, at one point, he was at college in Northern California um, with a sort of a military grant. And uh, he was contacted by someone uh, who seemed to know quite a bit about him mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and started to ask him if you know, if you're interested in UFOs, would you like to know more? Mm -hmm. And the guy I interviewed, um, I, I call him uh, Thomas, mm -hmm. um, said, yeah, yeah, I'd love to know more. And uh, the guy said, okay, well, we'll, you'll be contacted shortly. And he was, and he was asked if he wanted to join, basically, the secret group that is studying UFOs within the military. Mm -hmm. And uh, he made some queries about what exactly this guy was saying. And the, infer the inference was that he would be part of a team that would be recovering crashed UFOs. And wow. Yeah. He basically learned that uh, the US military had recovered at least two craft during the Vietnam War. On mm -hmm. um, that, you know, Agent Orange, was, which was being used to defoliate jungles and supposedly root out the enemy, that mm -hmm. was not that was not the purpose of it. It was to sort of clear areas where UFOs had gone down, so they could recover them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Thomas was asked if he wanted to join this group, and uh, he, his, he was told his clearance would be bumped up. He would be given a promotion, and. He would have to uh, be completely quiet about this. He would not be allowed to have any relationships or tell anyone. He would have to basically be a loner. And he had mm -hmm. just started developing a relationship with a wonderful woman. And so he ultimately declined <laughs> to join, mm -hmm. uh, but kept in touch with, with these guys and learned all kinds of information. and met some of these guys firsthand and in fact at one point was talking to one of these government guys who we thought was a government guy mm -hmm. and it turned out it wasn't a human at all as he's talking uh -huh. to this guy he this guy turned into a gray et boom mm -hmm. but he, he was given all kinds of information about area 51 Mm -hmm. He learned that there's vast tunnel systems beneath the United States and that Area 51 is basically an underground city with some 10,000 people in it. Wow. Uh, the, yeah, the very lowest levels are devoted purely to ETs. Mm -hmm. um, and some of these actually even have different atmospheres. And mm -hmm. hum humans are not allowed to go down there unless they have an ET escort. Mm -hmm. uh, talked about J. Rod, who's a you know one of the ETs that have been uh, talked about by other whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, J. Rod is a real uh, ET, a real gray, and uh, yeah, I mean, just got all kinds of information about how our government is recovering UFOs. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, to me, the most interesting experience he had was when he met one of these, quote, Omega team members, mm -hmm. uh, which are the ones who are recovering it. And he thought he was a normal human. But as Thomas says, and I quote, he was a shapeshifter. I was standing five feet in front of him when he changed to a gray. So, uh, wow. Do you think they <laughs> use some kind of psychic mind control that changes their appearance or do they actually change their shape? What, what do you think is going on there? Uh, well, we know they can, you know, influence a person's perception. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but I think in most, well, certainly in that case, I think they weren't so much affecting his mind as they were actually um, changing their actual appearance, putting mm -hmm. on, putting on a disguise. I don't know. It's hard hard to say when beings are that powerful, that telepathic. Uh, it could be that they are just able to influence people's perception mm -hmm. very, very easily. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I'm not sure. The whole screen memory phenomena is quite complex. Mm -hmm. I've talked to many contactees uh, who, particularly as children, were visited and by ETs who did put on weird appearances. Everything, I mean, you name it. Clowns comes up quite often. Uh, teddy bears, superheroes, Barbie dolls, cartoon characters, animals, oh, wow. uh, you name it. Mm -hmm. so they definitely do have the ability to either change their appearance or influence how people perceive them. Mm -hmm. I think, again, this lends to my opinion that they're not here to ruin us or destroy us um, because of they wouldn't protect the minds of children by having them perceived as teddy bears and clowns if they wanted to frighten them and scare them and control them they wouldn't you know they would not do that but the other thing too is i think they've taken just from the evidence um they've taken actually a lot of different strides to be as um, less as least startling as possible and um but I also want to ask you, what about all these, okay, we, we hear about these um, UFOs that are being um, found and reclaimed and stuff. In my logic mind, I don't think they're bad drivers. What is bringing the ships down? I mean, maybe it's mechanical failure. I could imagine some of that. But with, with all these ships that are coming down, are they being brought down by, by say, the military or a branch thereof or why are there why are why is this even happening because you would think they'd have the technology to keep from having their ships taken over and their beings being killed on impact yeah well there is some evidence of that objects being brought down by what we would term particle beam weapons mm -hmm. uh, but also there's some pretty good evidence that this is in fact accidental and mm -hmm. ha having talked to a number of contactees, especially ones who are like really fully conscious and having very extensive contact, have asked mm -hmm. about this. And what they were told is that flying UFOs is a little trickier than you might think because they, what they do is they are riding, they are using sort of the magnetic um, field surrounding our planet, which fluctuates wildly. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so this is why you kind of see them fluttering around with that falling leaf motion or sort of bouncing up and down as if they're in waves, because mm -hmm. uh, they are. There's magnetic sheets that surround our planet, magnetic lines, lines, lines of gravity. Mm -hmm. And this is what they use to fly their craft. And they can suddenly you know, like a downdraft in the atmosphere, uh, fluctuate wildly, and this can bring them down. Uh, they're mm -hmm. not perfect. I think one of the reasons is that they are out there in much larger numbers than people realize. Mm -hmm. uh, this, well, you know, you can't go outside and see a UFO anytime you want. One of the reasons for that is they're cloaked. They have the ability to hide their appearance, to mm -hmm. basically be invisible. Uh, but yeah, there are accidents. Uh, UFOs are not seen, t you know, 20 times a day. MUFON, you know, gets 20 reports daily. New Fork, National UFO Reporting Center. And when you factor in the fact that most people do not report their sightings to MUFON, one in 10 would be very generous. It's probably closer to one in 100. Mm -hmm. so, so that would make the actual numbers of sightings, like in the U.S. alone, anywhere from 200 to 2,000 daily. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah, this, this is a much more active phenomena, I think, than people realize. 
Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, that's just one of the reasons they come at night. People are like, oh, why are they so secretive they come at night? Well, it's because it's a lot easier for them to fly at night mm -hmm. due to the fact that there's not as much interference from the sun. Mm -hmm. And also the high light levels do bother them. And mm -hmm. uh, when, they, when they come into people and collect them and bring them on board, it's mm -hmm. like, why, why is it at night? Why are they sneaking into my house? Uh, you know, why is it so, why, why, why don't they just ask permission? Mm -hmm. Well, they do. They do ask permission. The truth is every experience we have is something that we've sort of given permission to have. This is mm -hmm. something that we, you know, every learning lesson we have is something that our full selves, our higher selves, our true selves have allowed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so when an ET takes someone, they have asked them, but it's, we're we're very compartmentalized in our consciousness, and our mm -hmm. little our little tiny bit of conscious awareness, which is basically our ego, uh, is not often aware of what our whole mind is saying. So, yeah. uh, they, people do give permission. This is not a hostile act. What people are being brought on board to to uh, be taught, to be healed be given messages and by their fruits you shall know them mm -hmm. uh, yes people do sometimes have PTSD and nightmares but once you move past that fear this is when people really begin to wake up and realize how incredibly spiritually enlightened they've become as a result of their contact they start having OBEs mm -hmm. they, start, they start having precognition mm -hmm. learning, learning about past lives Oh, healing is such a big part of this. Over and over again, people come away from their experiences feeling like they have the ability to heal. Mm -hmm. I hear this over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So, well, I, yeah. would, I would agree with you. It's changed my life completely. And the things that I used to be interested in, I'm not so interested anymore because I'm much more aware of the bigger picture, the spiritual application, the potential for where we're going, which is amazing, we can't imagine because we've been in the role of a, what I call a flea circus. I don't know if you've seen a flea circus, but the fleas, they, they, they look like they're all trained. Well, they are because they've never been able to reach their, their potential. And in a very similar way, we've never been able to reach our potential. And now we're, now that is all breaking free. So I think we're living in probably one of the most exciting times ever um, and in some ways terrifying because it's all very strange and new to all of us. But I think what you do, what I do, what many of us are doing is trying to demystify this and bring it into our natural reality and accept that this is an element of our natural reality. Would you agree with that, um, Preston? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's natural to fear the unknown, especially mm -hmm. because our culture is steeped in fear. We are taught oh. to fear. Yeah. This is it's... something I think there's been a concerted effort to do. Yeah. Uh, there is, I'm just going to say it, there's an evil element within our society. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's pretty clear, just judging from the divisiveness, the uh, unequal distribution of wealth. Mm -hmm. um, there are some people who are on my naughty list. They know who they are. The banking industry, yeah. the insurance industry, yeah. uh, the, the people who are enacting this cover-up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not right. This mm -hmm. is this is unkind. This is uh, direct directly flies in the face of compassion, truth, and love. Mm -hmm. uh, it's time that we all realize we are all one, and uh, to hide the truth is not a kind act mm -mm. Uh, knowledge is power uh, don't stop lying <laughs> there's so much lying so much corruption mm -hmm. i'm so encouraged because now people are waking up you know how like a diamond is is formed with a lot of pressure and a lot mm -hmm. of going through all sorts of pressure well, that's kind of what's happened to humanity. We've gone through some really tough times and mm -hmm. it has educated us. It has made us grow. We are mm -hmm. now growing spiritually by leaps and bounds. And I think people have are truly waking up. 
now and we're ready we're ready to leave war behind yeah. we are ready to embrace love and truth mm -hmm. uh, we are ready to embrace the fact that we are autonomous truly powerful unlimited beings uh, mm -hmm. who have the ability to do telepathy mm -hmm. um, who can levitate who can have precognition who can heal each other mm -hmm. and uh the evil element within society this is their last hurrah mm -hmm. so sorry we don't need you anymore you've done a good job thanks you've been terrific enemies yeah uh, but now uh we, we don't need you it's time for world peace i think yeah. we really really need to go there I, I I agree, Preston, wholeheartedly. And it also, uh, another analogy is of, of a lobster or a crab or anything like that. They grow to the point where they no longer fit their shell. And how uncomfortable that is uh, at that point where they where they're forced to to to, sh to shed their 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 shell and and start a new one. And I think we're very much at that point in humanity. And um, boy, our time has just run out so fast today, Preston. I'm wondering, um, before uh, before we run out of time, do you do you want to basically encapsulate the book? Um, it's called Wondrous. It's out now, isn't it? Yeah, it's just released, just about hmm, a month ago, really. A month ago. Um, and where can so. people find it? I guess on your website. Yeah, I do have a website. If you just search my name on the internet, you'll find it. I've got a YouTube channel as well where I'm talking about my research. Mm -hmm. The book is available on, uh, at bookstores and online retailers. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think this is an important subject. I it really, really is. is. It really is. Even if people don't necessarily 100% believe it, they're going to benefit from reading the material and getting a glimpse at what's possible, a glimpse at what other people are experiencing. And in that way, people are going to grow. And once uh, consciousness expands, it never goes back to the way it was before. You're, you know, it's <laughs> an amazing, amazing phenomenon. But I really encourage everyone to, to get a copy of your book and read it because it will open their minds and and I think really that kind of comes before the rest is is well first we have to think it and then we know it's possible and then we shift into a a whole new reality so I'm pretty pretty excited about our future actually yeah me too I think this is the number one ET message to wake mm -hmm. people up become mm -hmm. psychic if we all become psychic we can read each other's minds be mm -hmm. telepathic guess what no more lies, no more corruption. Yep. No more, you no know, false enmity. People are not really truly racist. Most of them are mm -hmm. very loving people. Mm -hmm. there's, been a, there's been a false sort of narrative put forward. Mm -hmm. uh, humanity is a very loving species, and mm -hmm. we need to wake up to the fact that we are all one. And this is what the ETs are trying very hard to do it's to mm -hmm. wake us up to who we are mm -hmm. loving connected spiritual powerful compassionate beings and mm -hmm. i think i think we're there we can do it it's going to be a great future i i agree preston and i so appreciate you coming on the show with me today and talking a little bit about um, about your book and about the information and about the phenomenon in general. I, I think it's one of the most important conversations we could have. And and besides that, it, it reveals um, a happier future, a better future. It doesn't drag us down. These conversations tend to build us up and invigorate us and, and energize us. And I want to thank you so much for being on the show today and I'm hoping you will come back in the future and share more of your amazing experiences with us. <laughs> Thanks Karen, anytime. You know I love talking about this and yeah it's always a delight speaking with you. Oh thank you uh, Preston, it's a delight to have you on the show. Um, I'm just going to do a, a little bit of information here before we go but I want to encourage everyone again to check out uh, Preston Dennett 
and his uh, YouTube channel. He has lots of content. I think, do you put a show out every week? It seems you put a show out every week talking about your experiences. Yeah, I try to. I miss a, a week here and there, but, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah. There's really lots of, just, you can just fill your boots. I, I, I rarely miss an episode because it's so interesting. And also, uh, Preston, your style of writing and presenting is very, um, enjoyable as well. So thank you. Thank you again. Hey, always a pleasure, Karen. Thank you. Okay. So um, just to remind everybody, um, as I frequently um, talk about on convergence, there is the quantum health transformation online course. And I also have other inspiring information that's absolutely free. And if you would like to help support my work, please consider purchasing some of my beautiful Zen Domes Organites. We're not making more right now, but there's still quite a few available still on my website, www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com. If you want to help create the change you wish to see in the world, take exquisite care of the temple body, raise your vibrational frequency, and learn from the Quantum Health Transformation Program. If you have any questions about our discussion today, just make a comment in the comment section and I'll do my best to answer them. You can join me and bring your friends as we go live at 1 p.m. Mountain Time every Tuesday here on People for People Radio. That's www.peopleforpeople. Dot ning dot com. I'd like to uh, express a special thank you to Gaz and Vanessa for hosting me and moderating for me here on People for People Radio, and much love and light to you, the viewers. Thank you for sharing this time with me. If you would like to enjoy more of my quant content, again, you can check out my website at www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com where you will find an abundance of free resources to assist with energetic ascension into physical, mental, and spiritual paradise. You will find the Nine Steps to Quantum Health Transformation, which is, as I mentioned, a free, no-strings-attached, comprehensive online lifestyle course and you'll also find uh, some of my other serial podcasts, like The Quantum Guide Show, which are interviews with awakened masters. Let them share their quantum work with you. And uh, much love and much blessings to all of you. We'll see you next week.